Welcome to Straight Painting. I'm your host, Zach, and on this week's episode, we're going to discuss the work of Henrietta Mabel May, also known as H. Mabel May. Henrietta Mabel May was born in 1877 in Montreal, Quebec, and she was one of the founders of the Beaver Hall Group, formed in 1920, which was a Montreal-based group of artists in the vein of the Group of Seven. The group's name is taken from their shared studio space in Montreal, 305 Beaver Hall Hill. The two groups shared a few overlaps, with A.Y. Jackson acting as the Beaver Hall Group's first president, and with some members like Edwin Holgate occasionally being included in the Group of Seven's roster of artists. Unlike the Group of Seven, though, the Beaver Hall Group had an equal inclusion of female and male artists, with the original group being made up of eight women and eleven men, as well as for Anglo and Francophone members that helped to bridge the Montreal art scene of the day. The Beaver Hall group also focused on more than landscapes in their works, including more portraits, city scenes, and still lives of modern life in Montreal and the area. If you'd like to more, learn more, I'd suggest these articles from the Carleton University website, the National Gallery of Canada website, and the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts website, which I'll leave links for in the description box below. Another notable feature of the Beaver Hall group is that their roster had a shared mentor, William Brimner. He had trained Mabel May, Nora Collier, Emily Coonan, Prudence Heward, Edwin Holgate, Lilius Torrance Newton, and Anne Savage, among others. Brimner was a Canadian artist who was born in Greenock, Scotland in 1855, and he immigrated with his family at the age of two. He was known as a figure and landscape painter, and one of his most well-known paintings is giving out rations to the Blackfoot Indians, Northwest Territories, which he painted in 1886 while visiting the Siksika Nation Reserve near Glacian, Alberta. The painting depicts the distribution of rations, here four days' worth of flour. Food rations were among the many promises made, and not kept, to the First Nation signatories of treaties with the Canadian government, and in practice they were a tool of control being used to force First Nations people onto reserves by being withheld, and then to maintain power by limiting the amount of rations given out and in, in distributing food that was unfit to eat. Bremner's painting breaks from the earlier European tradition of Canadian painters like Cornelius Krieghoff and Paul Kane, who attempted to depict Indigenous peoples in stereotypical portrayals, and instead shows a small part of the everyday experience of the reserve system in Canada, the desperate need for food. Around the time of this painting, Siksika leader Crowfoot gave a speech on the inadequacy of the rations and the risk of starvation facing his people, which Bremner would have been well aware of, having met with Crowfoot and through newspaper reports of the handling of the rationing system at the time. Returning to Mabel May, her style has been described as being interested in form and rhythm perspective rather than the more external manifestations of nature, and as a lyrical depiction of landscape with bold sweeping colors and simplified forms. It's the perfection of painting shapes over things. Her city scenes remind me of A.J. Casson's Housetops in the Ward, depicting the crowded, claustrophobic feeling of buildings in the city, and her landscapes remind me of Lauren Harris's work with their soft roundedness and use of light. In Snowflake's studio window, we find a winter scene of Montreal around May's home at the time. The falling snow lends a dimness to the scene of the crowded rooftops pressing in on us, forcing our view to the center and top of the frame where we find the Dome of St. James Cathedral, now Mary Queen of the World. The dome is cropped off at the top, further emphasizing the closeness of the outside buildings, creating a slight feeling of claustrophobia and a wanting to escape the coming cabin fever of the winter spent indoors. A common feature of Montreal paintings is the use of churches to help place us in the world. It's a city where, as Samuel Clemens said, you can't throw a brick without breaking a church window. These next two paintings are the same piece, one as a study and one as the final work. In the study, we find a view out of another window, looking at the side of a church and the backsides and rooftops of our neighbors. Everything has been reduced to its simplest shape and the values provide us the depth of the scene. In the final piece, we find more vibrancy in the scene, getting a good sense of the time of day based on the strength of the hues on the buildings and the light shining off of the snow, which is no doubt helping to dry the laundry hung up from the windows. Comparing the two pieces, we find that May has added more detail to the final picture, but has maintained the use of using 
these simplified shapes to fill in those details and retaining a comfortable simplicity that allows the compactness of our surroundings to still breathe in the space. Moving outdoors and away from the hemmed-in feeling of the city, we find another study of maize showing us a river view from a farm. The warmer hues of the ground and the water might place this scene in the springtime and offer an overall more pleasant feeling than the cool desaturated hues we found in Jackson's Edge of the Maplewood. Her composition using the rounded line of the ice and the trees leaning in from the edges keeps my eye locked in on the open water in the dead center beside the shore. Melting snow is the first picture of maize that I had stumbled across as I was wandering the National Gallery in Ottawa, viewing the Canadian painting section, when I walked around a divider from the Lauren Harris section and found it hanging in the corner. It shares a little of Harris's style, most notably in the way she's depicted the mountains and snow, and also with the rays of sun shining down in the distance. However, it is a much darker and colder piece than Harris's work. Here May is presenting us a moment of midwinter thawing that sort of muddy brown winter you get in Toronto, though this scene is nowhere near there. The cycle of freezing and thawing, leaving thin mounds of slowly smelting snow, keeping the ground muddy and sticky, waiting for more snow to roll in and the ground to freeze up again. The piece that I've decided to use for my practice this episode is Autumn and the Laurentians, which to me represents the four seasons in one picture. The cool gray of the sky brings out the warm orange of the turning leaves in the woods surrounding the small lake, which is highlighted by the last rays of summer sun glowing on the fields ready for harvesting. When that work is done, we'll turn into the comfort of the house on the hill to wait out the winter until spring arrives once more. I really like the balance I see in this picture, so with this piece I'll want to focus on two things. Keeping the balance between the warmth and coolness of the hues in the composition, as well as wanting to preserve the balance of the hard and soft edges found in the natural and human made elements of the piece. And how did we do? All right, all right, all right. We've got our finished card here, and before we put some top coat on it and sleeve it up to put into the deck, let's just do our standard review to make sure that everything turned out the way that we wanted to. Overall, I'm very happy with the way that this card looks. I think we have maintained that balance between the warm and cool colors and also between the use of our hard edges and our more soft rounded edges in the card. Um, I'm really happy with the greens that I was able to achieve in the bottom section. Um, I think that's really captured that you know, sort of summer light uh, as well. I'm really happy with the cool shades that I was able to get into the lake in the center here that really locks in that sort of chill of, of coming winter. Um, as well, uh, I was able to get some very straight lines on the edges of the building uh, and then contrast them with the rounded lines of the mountains and things. So I'm very happy with how all of that turned out. And I'm going to really look forward to drawing this card in my deck. So as I said, I'm really happy with how this card turned out, which means that my final takeaway for you as always is to remember that the effort you put in is more important than the perfection you achieve. And that's to say, the more you try, the better you'll get. You just have to try. I want to thank you for joining me, as always. Um, I had a lot of fun actually learning about the work of H. Mabel May and the Beaver Hall group as well, and I hope that you've learned something as well throughout this entire process. I hope that you also join me again in two weeks' time when we'll take on a new project and have a new card to paint. Until then, take care and peace. <laughs>